This is a world of hidden mics and two-way mirrors. A world where nothing is private. I got some paperwork hand-delivered to me. Harry Cole is an expert. The best there is. Did Dad know about this? No, Dad's at work today. Let me tell you something about Harry Cole. The best bar none. I'll drink to that. Best what? The best bugger on the West Coast. Excuse me, Mrs. Adelson? Hey, no. I just want to give you this. Listen. You do. <laughs> no, don't be scared. He can bug anybody, anytime, anywhere. Do you know that? Is it involved? No, 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 no. Nobody knows how you did it, though, Harry. It was the hell of a scandal, too. Confirmed within the last two hours, Charlie Adelson's trial for murdering this man, FSU law professor Dan Markell, will now start on October 23rd. Does it involve me or other people? Well, probably the two of us. They're not people to him, just voices. He doesn't know them, and they don't know him. You probably have a general idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, it had nothing to do with me. I mean, I just turned in the tapes. Who is the paperwork sent from? John, something that came hand to hand to me as I exited the building today. If someone's messing with you, they're messing with me. If someone's messing with me, they're messing with you. Call them, find out who the fuck it is now. Me on this. Let me tell you something. I was a driver with that one, and he told me the whole story. Be careful, Harry. Take it through. Find out who the fuck it is. That's all I'm asking you. I don't know who you have to talk to, but it's, it needs to be nipped in the bud. You're an idiot. You gave a fucking wrong number. Get the fucking number and a fucking call because I'm going to call them. That's okay. Okay. I'm going to fucking go to the cops right now. Okay. Well, either you go to the cops or we go to the cops to, hey, to find out. What a stupid out. conversation. Stan, please. I'm trying to work. Call them. Find out who the fuck it is now. Trust me on this. I said, let me call you back later. What the hell are they talking about, for Christ's sake? Stanley, please, I'm trying to get this done. All right, don't get excited. Well, I'm getting fed up. What's the matter, Harry? If there's one surefire rule that I have learned in this business is that I don't know anything about human nature. I don't know anything about curiosity. I don't, that's not part of what I do. There is nothing private about the conversation. Listen. Whatever it is, I'll, I'll take a look at the paperwork. That would be great. Perfect. All right. I'll talk to you later. Love you, honey. Bye. Love you. Bye. You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Happy Sunday, everyone. That was from the YouTube account, the Society page, doing a take of the trailer for Francis Ford Coppola's great movie, The Conversation, one of my favorite movies, and certainly wiretapping is central to the case of the murder of Dan Markell. And today we're going to be talking, or I'm going to be talking about Wendy Adelson's problem. And it's really more like problems. So her first problem was Dan Markell. And he was a problem because he was preventing her from moving from Tallahassee, a town she hated, to Miami with her kids relocating. He was also threatening her law license, threatening to censor her, censoring her, asking the court to censor her over assets she hid. 
or he says she hid. She, of course, denies everything. And they decided, or at least I can say confidently, that Charlie Adelson decided, and I believe, along with Wendy and her mother and father, I believe this was a family affair. That's my personal belief. Wendy and Donna are unindicted co-conspirators in the murder of Dan Markell. And just to refresh where we're at, the shooters have been tried and convicted. The middle woman has been tried and convicted. Her brother has been tried. Charlie Adelson has been tried and convicted. And we're waiting to see if the finale of this story is that Wendy or her mother Donna or both of them get indicted and perhaps convicted. So the second problem is once the murder went down, she had to pretend that she didn't know anything about it, that she was heartbroken. And last episode on this subject, we went over some of her police interrogation and her boohooing and how she couldn't really fully recreate it. I don't know if any human can recreate that kind of sobbing and uneven breaths that you get with that kind of hysteria. And so, so far, that problem seems to have gone away, but it's always just out there in the distance, out there as a possibility. But more than that, it's the image game. And for the Adelson's family image is everything. And to be seen right now as a possible murderer, the family has been totally exposed. She's been exposed as a person. I think Jeffrey Lacoste said something very insightful that the worst thing that you can do to Wendy is point out that she's not perfect. And status and image are very important to this family. And what I understand has happened since this, as the story has gone on is that they are now, this is the rumor, socially being, in some circles, they couldn't get the grandchildren, Wendy's children, the schools they wanted. So they're being pushed away, outcasts in the kind of society, in the circles that they want to run in. But it's always so interesting when Wendy takes the stand because she's been given immunity in every trial that she's testified in, including her brother's trial. Now, my understanding of this kind of immunity is so she has immunity for anything that she says in court, but she can still be tried or indicted for, for being an accessory, a conspirator in this murder. And it's always so interesting when she testifies because she lies so much. So my understanding of, and I'm going to, I'm not fully done all my research. I've just started it. My understanding of immunity deals like this is that they are contingent on you testifying truthfully. And so many people have pointed out how many lies. So does that mean that the lie has to be big or small? Does it matter? And is that true? So that's what I'm trying to figure out. Let me know if you know in the comments. So when, I'm going to take a quick break. When I come back from the break, we're going to look at Wendy Adelson's testimony and her brother Charlie's trial. Stay tuned. If you are enjoying this episode of my true crime report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today.
If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. So I, I'm going to start a little bit into the testimony where I think they take a break. And right after the break, I think that's where it gets really interesting. The showdown between Wendy and Georgia Kappelman, the state's attorney, who I think is fantastic. I think she did a great job. I really encourage my listeners to listen to the episode I did with the king of the cold cases, John Lewin, about trying no body cases, cold cases. He's won every single one of them, the cold cases he's tried since 2002, according to LA Magazine. Okay, I just want to make sure I pulled up the right thing. And what I got from his interview is that, first off, a lot of things, but one of the most important things is when you are trying a no body case or a difficult case or a case that most prosecutors wouldn't attempt, it is very important to recreate the the world and small evidence can be hugely important if you support it with uh the testimony of the of the people who were around the defendant so it, it's really fascinating and it made me more optimistic that Donna and Wendy could be tried successfully in a case like this. So it, I, it, I would love to see, you know, Wendy up on the stand and really press to, you know, ha like let the jury try to see if they will buy that she went out of her way, drove by the crime scene, went out of her way to buy liquor so far from her home and most people I know who go to part, they get the liquor right before they go to the party, not seven, eight hours beforehand or whatever it is. So they just had a break. Resume your examination. And they've gone through the motions concerning the divorce. Wendy, of course, kept a ring that was a very important ring to the Markell family. It was a, a ring from a relative who had been in the Holocaust, sentimental, and she refuses to return it. But you'll see in her testimony that she does everything she can to amplify what she would consider Dan Markell's failures. He, so he, the court, had, he, we agreed in our divorce settlement that I would sell the house and I'd get it, you know, I'd get half of it. We'd, I'd get half of it. And when that happened, he, he didn't hand over the money because he felt that she was withholding truthfully about her own assets in the divorce. So it, so she will constantly say, well, I didn't get that money from the house. I didn't get the money from the house. Like it's a crime. And, or if Dan Markell, got turned down from a job. She loves talking about his, what other people would consider small failures. Thank you, Your Honor. I want to talk a, a little bit about your brother, Charlie. Is he an older brother or a younger brother to you? I'm the youngest of three, so I have two older brothers. They're both older than me. All right, and he's the middle child, Charlie? That's right. All right, and are you closer to Charlie or to the other brother? I'm closer to Charlie. How much time were you spending with Charlie back in 2013 and 2014? Not a lot of time. Um, I was in Tallahassee. He was in South Florida. Did really, he work a lot? He worked a lot. Yeah. Did he work at one location or travel around? So this was, this amused me, this idea 
this was a defense idea that Charlie Adelson was too busy to be the maestro of this hit. So they constantly reinforce this idea. 30, I worked at 38 different dental clinics. I was always busy. I'm such a hard worker. So not only does he have a strong worth work ethic, meaning he's not the type of guy who would do this kind of crime, orchestrate this kind of crime, but he also was too busy. His schedule was too full to, to, to schedule a murder. He would travel around. He worked at multiple locations. <laughs> was he pretty successful in his job? Yeah, he came up with a great business model for what he did, and he worked really hard and was very successful. Was your brother known to carry a lot of cash? I know. I mean, he had cash on him sometimes. I never saw large sums of cash. Did you ever see stapled cash? I never saw stapled cash. Were you familiar with his practice of stapling cash together in stacks? No, I never knew about that. So the hitmen were paid with stapled money. And that is the relevance of that line of questioning. So, of course, Wendy's going to deny anything that makes her family look bad, herself look bad, or her brother look bad. But she makes outrageous claims like she's a lawyer and she claims she didn't know who her brother was charged with committing this crime with. So a bunch of true crime people who have no relationship to this case know more about it than the defendant's sister, who's a lawyer. I'm sure the jury had a good laugh about that back in the uh, jury room. Was your brother Charlie protective of you? When I was a little kid. Yeah. What about as an adult? As an adult? I mean, not not particularly. Is it fair to say that during the year or so leading up to the murder of Dan Markell that your brother did not like your ex? I mean, I don't think he, yeah, he probably didn't like him, but I also think he didn't spend a lot of time thinking about him. Did he ever like him? Yeah, I mean, I think they, they got along fine. So it wasn't on his mind to murder Dan Markell. He, he didn't think about him enough to orchestrate and be the maestro of this, <laughs> this murder for hire plot. So just a note about Wendy's appearance and her demeanor. It's so Wendy Adelson to me. This image, she does an imitation of a caring human. This is her imitation of a caring human being. The head is tilted to the side. The hair and makeup are perfect. The outfit seems to be carefully chosen right down to the jewelry. And it, and she doesn't show the kind of verbal nervousness that's, that even I show <laughs> analyzing her testimony or other witnesses show on the stand. She seems in total control, total control of herself and, and she has a script and she's going to stick to the script. So everything seems like her brother's testimony, very, very calculated, planned and delivered in the way that she wants to have it delivered. Did your brother ever mention hiring a hitman to kill Dan Markell? No. I'm going to turn your attention to your law enforcement interview, and I'm referring to page 25, lines 13 through 15. Send me on your tab one. Start this tab here. Okay. All right, so page 25. Do you find it? Yes. 
quote, it was always his joke. He said, I looked into hiring a hitman and it was cheaper to get you this TV. Is that what he said? That was a joke that he made, yes. And hiring the hitman, that was to kill Dan Markell, right? That was the joke. That was the joke that he made in poor taste, yes. Not to kill... Look at Charlie Adelson's face. Wow, he's just like, oh, why did I make, why did that joke get out? That joke is not helpful to me now. It was so not helpful. And Wendy knew that that joke would get around. She told it to the TV repairman. I think it was written into the script because she couldn't wait to tell the police officer questioning her, oh, my brother had this horrible joke and it's such, and I made this joke this morning at my made up, at my alibi. Basically, they set up this TV repair. Je according to Jeffrey Lacasse, who had dated Wendy, he came over one time and she wanted him to look at it for TV. And she looked at it. He looked at it, excuse me, and it looked like to his eye that someone had purposely taken something heavy and hit the TV. And he thought the kids were too young to handle something that heavy. And it seemed to be very purposely broken. And then Wendy insisted that they all watch a movie, not on the TV in the other room, which he was very eager to set up, set the DVD player up on. But they all had to watch on the broken TV and the kids were whining and crying. But she insisted that would be the kids. And it was a present to the kids. It was movie night to the kids. So she made so sure that this alibi, that her TV was broken, her mother Donna scheduled the appointment with a TV repairman. And that she told this joke. So the TV, so there's so many things that have double meanings. So when they when they talk about TV on the wiretaps, they're often talking about the hit. You you got what I'm talking about. Someone else. No. Well, he never used his name. Okay. Well, he's hiring you the TV because it's cheaper as a divorce present than a hitman. Who else would he be hitting with the hitman? I never really thought about it because it was not a thing that he meant. He just made a bad joke. Well, you repeated the joke, didn't you? Yeah, and she made note to the police officer because she knew it was about her ex-husband, Dan Markell. She thought it was important to tell the police officer that members of her family had told this joke so they, they don't go down the wrong avenue and investigate them. She made sure she got it right out in the open, but now here she's saying, I don't know what you mean. I don't know who it was about, who the hitman was going to kill. I mean, it seems at times in this examination that Wendy will just disagree with things just to maintain con to, to maintain her idea of control of the examination. Does that make sense? He repeated the joke. Didn't you also repeat the joke? To other people? Yes, like Jeff Lacoste. I never said that to Jeff Lacoste. You didn't tell Jeff Lacoste that your brother got you that TV as a divorce present because it was cheaper than hiring a hitman. I may have repeated that joke in the context of the TV, yes. All right, and who is Jeff Lacasse? Jeff Lacasse was a person I dated in 2013. And did you tell Jeffrey Lacasse shortly before the actual murder that your brother really had looked into hiring a hitman? I did not. Did he buy you a TV as a divorce present? Did my brother buy me a TV as a divorce present? Yes. Sorry, I should have yes. clarified that. And so what I mean about listening to my interview with John, John Lewin, the king of the cold cases, is have a jury, have Jeffrey Lacoste, who's a great witness, have him come up and say, Wendy told me that Charlie looked in last summer to hiring a hitman for what I thought at one time was $15,000, I later revised it to $50,000, could have been. The dollar amount is the only thing I'm unsure about. And then have Wendy testify. 
or I don't know if she would testify or, you know, that she denies it and see which one the jury believes because I think people are confused when I think people thought Charlie was a great witness because he didn't fall apart and, and kind of crumble his lies held up to a certain extent. You know what I mean? His story that he tailored to the evidence held up under cross, but it looked ridiculous. It was not helpful to his case. I think he had a better shot not putting on a defense. So I think, I don't know. I, I would love to see how a jury put, put out the evidence in front of a jury and see, how, see which way the, see, see how it goes for you. I, I feel like some of these, and I'm not sure who's making the decisions, but some of these DAs and states or states attorney, depending on which state you're in, what they call it, are who I think a lot of times they're afraid to, to lose. And because I know it's taxpayer money, I know it's expensive, but in this case, the public really demands it because what you have here is a real example of disparity in wealth. So the Adelsons are were wealthy enough to hire the hit and not get their hands dirty. And they've had, they've enjoyed many, many years of freedom up until Charlie's conviction. I mean, he was in of course, jail waiting trial, but he still had many years of freedom. Many more years than Luis Rivera or Katie Magbanoa or Sigfredo Garcia. And so the hitman and the middle woman. And was the TV that your brother bought you as a divorce present the same TV that was being repaired on the morning of the murder? Yes. Did your mom text you that morning that the repair guy was coming to repair the TV? I don't remember that. Why would your mom have been involved in your TV repair appointment? Because I didn't purchase the TV. The TV was a gift that my brother paid for, but my mom went and got it and he reimbursed her. So the contract would have been under her name and her number. So when the, when the repair guy was coming, they may have called or texted the number on the account instead of my number. Okay. And after the murder, do you recall going to a dinner where you got sick at the table? It was about a month later. And yes, I remember. Where did that dinner occur? Was that here in Tallahassee or somewhere else? No, it was in Miami. All right. And was it like a, out at a restaurant? It was at a restaurant. All right. And when we say you got sick at the table, did you actually vomit at the table? I threw up at the table. All right. And did you ever hear your brother refer to that particular dinner as a celebratory dinner? No. Did you tell Jeffrey Lacoste that your brother called that a celebratory dinner? I did not. Did what? So, of course, it was a celebratory dinner. And of course, they were celebrating Dan Markell's murder. But this is a family of weak stomachs. So when Donna, after the bump, so what you saw, if you caught this episode since the beginning, what the society page did so well when they edited in the footage from the bump, which is when law enforcement put an undercover and had them hand over a picture of Dan Markell and with the number $5,000 and a number and saying, look, I have a relative in the pen, in prison. He needs to be taken care of just the way you took care of the middle woman and the shooters. That's when Donna, her, she, Charlie, according to Charlie, his mother, Donna, was suffering from all sorts of stomach ailments, diarrhea for weeks. So it makes sense that Charlie made some kind of really pointed remark to Wendy, whispered it in her ear about Dan Markell's murder, and she vomited on the table. 
I just saw a quick question in the chat about why Wendy would make them watch the TV when it was broken. Why would she would put her kids? Because the most important thing to Wendy is Wendy and getting away with this crime. So she wanted to make sure that Jeffrey Lacoste remembered that her TV was broken. So he might not remember it from looking at it, but certainly he'll remember it if he had to watch an uh, hour and a half movie plus maybe even even longer on a broken TV with kids complaining. So her kids come second to her. She's right. Most mothers couldn't sit through their kids being that. This was their gift that, you know, movie night, whining and complaining when it could be so easily fixed. But it was important for her to get away with this crime. Was that a. One moment was coming. Yes, sir. Was that dinner a celebration of the murder of your ex husband? Absolutely not. That dinner was the first time I left my house after over a month because I was terrified. And if it was a celebration of anything, it was a celebration that I was willing to leave the house and eat a meal. Do you know Catherine Magbanawa or have you ever met her? I have met her. Did you have an independent friendship with her or did you only know her through your brother? I only knew her through my brother. What was her relationship to your brother? They dated at some point. Was there anything unusual about her as a girlfriend from your viewpoint at the time? No. So she seemed like a typical kind of girl that he would date? She did. So what Georgia Kappelman is saying here is, and it was remarked on by at least Jeffrey Lacoste, is that Charlie was not interested in having kids. He didn't want to date women with children, and Katie had kids with the shooter, Sigfredo Garcia. So she was atypical in that way, and many people, including myself, who look at this case, see the parallel between Wendy using Jeffrey Lacoste as the fall guy, chump, so he'll be the suspect. Remember, Jeffrey Lacoste had planned to leave Tallahassee a trip right around the time that Dan Markell's murder was set to happen. And that would, in a car, very much look like the Prius that the shooters rented. Many people sort of fixate on that. Like, it's funny that the shooters would care about, you know, the environment or the mileage. But the important thing was that it looked similar to Jeffrey Lacoste's car. And they had broken up. They went to yoga together. This is the last time Jeffrey Lacoste talked to Wendy. He was walking to it. He threw up his hands, walked to his car. She called them back and she wanted to know all about his trip. When are you leaving? If you don't leave, why not? She really wanted to secure that he would be the suspect. He would take the heat off of her family. And unfortunately, he, he trusted his intuition and left early. So Katie was used because she had these connections. Fredo Garcia had a criminal record. She knew people. And that was what Charlie asked her. Do you know anyone who would rough someone up? But he didn't want Dan Markell just roughed up. He wanted him eliminated. And of course, Wendy benefits the most. Did you meet all his girlfriends? I don't know. I met many girlfriends. Okay. Um, did you meet Whitney Kick? I did. Okay. And Whitney Kick was after Catherine Magdanawa, correct? I believe so. All right. And there's a photograph, I'm sure you recall, of you on the beach with Catherine Magbanawa. Do you recall when that photo was taken? I do. Um, it was Father's Day 2014, so nine years ago. June 15th of 2014? That sounds right. So about a month before the murder? That sounds right. Where was this photo taken? It was in Miami. I went down to visit my dad for Father's Day. 
approaching and showing you what I've marked as states 35. Is this that photo? See, you'll see with Wendy's testimony, she adds a lot of touches, a lot of unnecessary information. It was Father's Day. See, we're a we're a loving family. Uh, I'm a loving person who cares about my father. She brought up that her mother didn't hate Danny, despite all the emails where she's calling him jibbers, where she's suggesting all sorts of revenge plots. This is a family obsessed with revenge. And she said, oh no, my mother made Danny banana bread. And then she hugged him as if, as if both things couldn't be possible. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not only do I think the banana bread is probably made up because <laughs> how would that, how could Georgia Kappelman disprove that at this point? Wendy, I'm sorry, excuse me, Donna and Harvey refused to testify. They said if they did, they were subpoenaed to testify and demanded that they testify that they would take the fifth. So there's no way to find out about that banana bread. But even if she did hug him and give him banana bread, two, those two things are not mutually exclusive. It would be in her best interest because also Dan Markell was asking for her mother because she was disparaging him so much to the children. The children were reporting back that grandma says that you, you're, you're stupid. Grandma says you're going to take uh, her sunshines away. So there was so much at stake for the Adelson family, mostly exposure of their image. I mean, can you imagine? Well, you used to go visit your grandchildren all the time. Why aren't you visiting them so much anymore? Why aren't they coming? Who is that woman with you when, when they come to visit, right? The supervised, whoever they would have to have supervise the visitation. And I think he would have gotten it. Graph and I've attached the data associated with it. Yes. Okay. Is fair and accurate copy of that photograph? Yes. Judge, I'd ask to move into evidence state 35. Okay. Okay. Commission to publish. You met? All right, is that you in the center? That's me. Which one's Catherine Magbanoa? The one on the left, our left in the picture. And how long had Ms. Magbanoa been dating your brother at the time this photo was taken? I have no idea. How many times had you met Ms. Magbanoa at the time this was taken? I think once before. Okay, how many times did you hang out with her total? Just these two times. Once at, at the dinner when I met her and then once at the beach for an hour. Was the relationship between your brother and Catherine Madbanoa serious, if you know? I don't know. I mean, 10 years ago, was it serious? Uh, not too serious. It never stood out to you during that time frame as like, oh, this is the one. No. All right. So you mentioned. So Charlie was buying vacations for Katie and Sigfredo Garcia, the hitman, after they broke up. So his defense was that they killed Dan Markell as a way to extort him for money. So saying like, you're going to be next which didn't make any sense why they wouldn't just go directly to him and point, point a gun at his head and demand the money that they knew he kept a lot of cash around in his safe. It was a ridiculous defense. I felt terrible for the defense attorney. 
he seemed to, at the end there, there was a hot mic moment where the defense attorney, Daniel Rashbaum, said to Charlie, you got to stop. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see him drop out of this case. He did a... He did. He brought his passion to it, but I, I don't. I wouldn't be surprised if he's had quite enough of having Charlie Adelson as a client. It seemed like it, Charlie was really the maestro in his his defense as well as this crime. I'm going to take a quick break. When I get back from the break, more of Wendy Adelson and her credible testimony in her brother Charlie's trial. Stay tuned. If you are enjoying this episode of my true crime report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. I just think it's just amazing that Wendy Adelson thinks that this, I'm not even so sure that it matters to her that this testimony is believable or or not i think the important thing for her is that she save herself above above all else and i think she gets a kick out of telling georgia kappelman that she doesn't know that she's wrong oh no did i just did i just lose our place I hope not. Let's see where we are. The relationship between your brother and Catherine Madvano is serious, if you know. I don't know. I mean, 10 years ago, was it serious? Uh, Not too serious. It never stood out to you during that time frame as like, oh, this is the one. No. All right, so you mentioned you thought Whitney Kick was after Catherine Magbanoa. What about June Umchinda? Do you know which one that is? When you say, do I know which one that is? June. She's not in the picture. No, ma'am. You're one of your brother's girlfriends, June Umchinda. Do you know her? I met I met someone named June. Okay, and w- would you agree that was also after Catherine Magbanoa? Yes, that okay. would have been after. When did you learn that Catherine Magbanoa was blackmailing your brother? for the murder of your ex-husband today. Hmm. So he never told you? No. You testified in Catherine McManamo's murder trial last year, didn't you? I did, yes. And she was convicted? She was convicted, yes. Of murder? Yes, of murder. Of murdering Dan Markell? Of murdering my children's father, yes. A crime for which she apparently is innocent because she was just a conduit for Sigfredo Garcia. Did you learn that today along with all of us? Well, I learned that someone made that argument. I don't know whether it's true or not true. Okay. That's ridiculous that she doesn't know. I don't know who's involved. She knows every detail of this case. And I wouldn't be surprised if she, if she helped craft Charlie's defense with his lawyer. She was in on some of those meetings with Charlie and his lawyer. You have no knowledge of it. I have no knowledge. In all the years this has been pending. In all of the years this has been pending. Your brother has known who killed your child's father and you didn't know. I did not know. Use of sarcasm is one thing I love. It's uh, that Georgia Kappelman does and disbelief. And she often gets censored for her snarky comments, but she's, this case is her baby and she's been on it. And I can't imagine how frustrated on it. She's been on this case for a long time. I can't imagine how frustrating to her it must be to have a witness like this, that she's given immunity to get up on the stand 
and say things that are so unbelievable. Do you know why Catherine McBanawa was on the payroll at the Adelson Institute? I believe that she worked there. What did she do there? I know my brother met her at a dental office, so I'm guessing administrative work of some kind. Did you ever observe her doing administrative work there? No. How did the killers in this case know that Dan Markell was planning to leave town the day after the killing? I have no idea. You knew he was planning to leave town the next day, didn't you? I did, yes. Did you convey that information to anyone? Absolutely not. To your knowledge, did your brother have that information? I don't know why he would have known that. This whole examination feels like Georgia Kappelman is practicing should Wendy Edelson ever be indicted and should she ever testify? Because this is, <laughs> let's just get back into it. I, I just feel like that she's bringing up these uh, amazing, amazing stories and and seeing how and seeing how they're they're going to sound and how they're going to fly. So if the killers were told it has to be done today because he's leaving town tomorrow because she's the only one who knew their schedule, knew Dan's schedule, she's the one who benefited the most. It's going to be pretty hard for a jury to be like, "Oh, well, I just to buy, oh, I just drove by the crime scene because I have a bad sense of direction." I just had this TV was broken for so long and I didn't fix it. So you have to remember that she broke the TV in anticipation of the first hit, which was supposed to happen in June. But the killers came up and, and Dan was with his children. And Luis Rivera said, no, we cannot kill a father in front of his children. So they went home. But according to Jeffrey Lacoste, during that for week in June, she was all nervous. He was buying her Pepto-Bismol, right? So you get the theme here. This is a family of weak stomachs once again. And I think it's, I think, I don't know. I think, it, I don't, I think if she gets the right jury, I think, I think she has, I would think that she would get convicted. There's just too many coincidences. Thank you for whoever left the comment that the uh, Tuto, the the nickname of the hit, one of the hitmen means owl. And she wears an owl shirt when she shows up on the day of the murder at the police station. So many, so many things with double meanings. TVs means hit, owl shirt. Right, all knowing, all seeing owls could also be a reference to that. And Tudo, Arl, we don't know how they knew that. I have no idea how they knew that, but it would have to come from someone familiar with Dan Markell's schedule, wouldn't it? They would have to find out somehow. I don't know how. Prior to Dan Markell's murder, when were you last in South Florida? <sighs> Was it this trip that's pictured here? No, because it was my dad's 70th birthday in early July. So I would have gone down to celebrate his birthday. Okay. When's dad's birthday? July 5th. How long were you down there for that July 5th trip? I don't really remember offhand, but my guess is about a week. Did you see Charlie Adelson on that trip? Yes. We celebrated my dad's birthday, the whole family and friends, everybody. Did you see Catherine Magdanawa on that trip? I don't remember if she was there or not. Did dad have a birthday party? Dad had a birthday party. Was it a big birthday? It was his 70th birthday. And was Catherine Magdanawa at the party? I don't remember seeing her there. Do you remember seeing June Umchinda at the party? I don't. Or Whitney Kick at the party? I don't. So it could have been any one of them or none of them. Or none of them. I don't remember there being a girlfriend with him at the party. All right. So you said the birthday was what, July 5th? It would have been July 5th. Okay. 
And do you know on what day you celebrated? Maybe his birthday, if it was, I felt like it was a weekend. So maybe if July 5th was a Saturday, then it was on his actual birthday. Okay. Tell me about the event who you said there were family and friends there about how many people, maybe like 50 people. What was so Charlie made a big deal out of saying, well, Katie and I, when I figured out she was the extortionist, she was not invited to my father's birthday party. But the more logical conclusion is that Katie was used just the way Jeffrey Lacoste was used to facilitate this plot. And that it was just a small gathering of close friends and close family. And no girlfriend was there for Charlie. Not the current girlfriend, not past girlfriend. So that's the point that Georgia Kappelman is making in those questions. What was on the menu? Um, we had paella. Were you responsible for securing the paella or is that your brother's job or someone else? I, I didn't arrange it, but I speak Spanish and no one else could communicate with him. So I spent some time helping him. That's why I remember what we ate. Okay. So another humble brag from Wendy, I speak Spanish. See, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm very useful at these events because I speak so many languages. I can communicate. I can translate when need be. And she puts in so many unnecessary details, but they always have a, there's always a strategy behind them and there's always a point. So she also makes the point when her Georgia Kappelman earlier, and I really wanted to get through her direct examination and the re-examination. I'm forgetting what's, is that the rebuttal examination? Is that what it's called? The rebuttal? Um, so I skip past it, but she says, my parents have joint, joint email address. So meaning forget, forget that my mother wrote all those nasty controlling emails telling me what to do and how important it is. The most important thing in the divorce is that you get custody of the children and you get the children to Miami near me. And now she says, so interesting. She was asked where she lives in Miami in relation to her parents. And she said, well, depending on Miami traffic, either 15 minutes to an hour away. How much do you want to bet that it's 15 minutes or less away and that the traffic has nothing to do with how, how long it takes to get there? Very close. This is a family enmeshed. So much so that some families become like a cult. So it becomes like, the Adelson family against the world. And Donna Adelson echoes that when she says, we're going to teach Dan Markell. She doesn't use that word. She uses his horrible nickname, which I won't repeat. We'll teach him, I'm paraphrasing, but we'll teach him not to mess with the Adelson family as if they are like the mafia. But it's really what they've become. Did your dad get any big gifts for his 70th? I don't remember. Did you, so there was no big lead up and discussion about some big gift that you were involved in at least. I don't remember. I'm, I don't remember if I gave him a present. I hope I did. Do you remember what anybody gave him for that birthday? I really don't. Was the murder of Dan Markell your dad's big gift? I, I mean, that's, of course not. That's a horrible thing to say. What about the, well, what about the grand? Isn't it interesting? Because that's the exact same phrase she used in her police interview. She says, oh, I made the joke. <laughs> Maybe I should do the fake breathy too thing. She does the fake breathy thing. <laughs> I made the joke that my brother bought this TV because he said it was cheaper than hiring a <laughs> hitman. That's such a horrible thing to say. Terrible thing to say. Same kind of language. It's like a life by imitation. 
I'll, I'll pretend to be a good person. And I believe my belief is that she uses her work with trafficked women for her, for that purpose to telegraph that she's a good kind of caring person. And it's obviously much more important to telegraph that to everybody when anybody who does a simple Google search on her will come up with the murder of her ex-husband, Dan Markell. And now what will come up is that her brother was convicted of being the maestro of it. And since she benefited the most, it's not going to make her look like a good person. So of course she has to pantomime that that's a terrible thing to say and be horrified. But I believe that that was his big gift. It wasn't the paella. And I believe the paella had a double meaning too. Because when, when Georgia Kappelman asked her about the paella, there's a sort of small smile that comes on her face. Grandchildren getting full unfettered access to the grandchildren. My Could parents that have been had the full big unfettered gift? access to their grandchildren always. Not when they lived in Tallahassee. Well, whenever they could come up and see them, they did. They were 50% of the time with, with Dan Markell, right? Sure. But whenever they were with me, they had full unfettered access. On the occasion that we're talking about dad's birthday, was that one of the times that when you came back to Tallahassee, your parents rode with you and then rented a car and drove home in the rental car? It was. And how long a drive is that? It's about seven hours. During that seven hour trip or at any time when you were in South Florida, was there any discussion of a murder at all? No, absolutely not. Any discussion of what to do about Dan? No. Any further discussion about bribing, converting to Christianity, any of those strategies? No, that ship had long sailed. Any discussion on that trip about the pending motion to preclude your mom from having contact with the kids? No. What was wrong with the TV? So it was the most important thing in her life going on this divorce when Dan Markell threatened to censor her. I can't remember if it was censoring her or if it was the motion or if they were both combined. If it was the motion that he wanted her mother to only be allowed supervised visitation with her grandchildren, meaning Donna Adelson. Dan Markell wanted Donna to have only supervised visitation because she was contributing to parental alienation. So the kids were getting so much negative talk from the Adelson family about their father that it was creating, that it was affecting his relationship with his children. So during this long drive, and that's the weirdest thing to me that these parents infantilized their daughter. So meaning Donna and Harvey insisted anytime Wendy made a long drive of driving with her, which I think is bizarre. B that was repaired the morning of the murder. I think one of my boys might have thrown something at it. There was like a little crack in the TV. How long had the TV been broken at the time that it got repaired? I honestly don't remember. Could it have been a long time, quite a long time? No, it could have been. I mean, I would be completely speculating. I don't remember how long it was broken for. Do you remember who repaired the TV? Yes, it was, uh, it was called the Geek Squad. Do you remember the window that the Geek Squad gave you for when they were going to be at your home to do this repair? I do. I think they said it was 8 to 12 or 9 to 1, something like that. Okay. Would you agree with me if I told you it was 8 to 12? That sounds right. All right. And do you recall what time the repairman actually arrived? No, but I remember they came on the early side. Okay. And was the repair done? Um, no. Why not? because I called my brother to find out how much a new TV would cost versus how much the repair cost, and it didn't make sense to repair it. It's cheaper to buy a new TV. Yeah. The records indicate the repairman was there for about 45 minutes. Does that? Yeah, I, de I decided not to go forward with the repair because what I wanted to achieve with having the TV repairman 
They already gave me an alibi, and that's really what I wanted, more than the TV repair. I already broke the TV purposely. <laughs> it's my opinion. So ridiculous. Many people have commented on her eyes being wide open, very almost hypnotic, and wondered if she was using some kind of hypnosis techniques or neuro-linguistic programming techniques. I wouldn't put it past her. This is a family also obsessed with power, getting their way, revenge, and image. And if you want undue influence over someone, what better way than to unknowingly hypnotize them? Doesn't seem to work on Georgia Kappelman, though. That sound accurate to you? Sure. That's my best. Sure. Why was he there for, for that long just to tell you, like, this thing can't be repaired or it's cost prohibitive to repair? Well, Do you I remember? I don't. My guess is he was there to try to see how he could repair the TV. And then he gave me an estimate. And then I found out what the estimate compared to the cost of a new TV would be. Who paid the repairman? I did. The repairman, you're familiar with his statement that you seemed really upset that day. What were you upset about? I have no idea. Were you upset that day? I don't remember being. Oh, yes, I was upset that day. I was upset. I remember Danny wanted to take the kids swimming and I wanted to pick them up earlier in the day. Okay, and so, so nothing to do with the TV. I don't think so. I probably wasn't that upset about the TV. Did you ever use the TV as code for the murder? No. Did you ever hear your mom do that? No. Do you remember on July 13th, 2014, seeing Jeffrey Lacasse at your place on Aqua Ridge? Do you even remember that evening? I don't remember seeing him at my place because by that point we were kind of broken up. So I don't think I would have seen him at my place. All right. So on that occasion, you couldn't have told him you wanted to share something with him in confidence. I think that would be very unlikely. We had kind of broken up at that point. And you couldn't have told him at that time the statement about the your brother really did look into hiring the hitman. I can't imagine I would have said that. Because also, Wendy seemed to also love. Yeah, it's interesting. Why did she tell Jeffrey Lacasse that? For one, one thing is. Jeffrey Lacasse said about Wendy is that she drank her dinners most night. So could she have drunk a, a whole bunch and could her guard slipped and could she have let it out? But the way I see it, that could be true. But the way I see it is that she enjoys getting away with things, letting things slip out, wearing an owl shirt, driving by the scene, skirting danger, it's exciting and getting away with it. And when she was asked in a different trial about being worried, I, I can't remember exactly what the question was, but I do remember her answer, which was, I will never be arrested or indicted in this crime. And she seemed so self-satisfied when she said it. I think she, it gives her a feeling of power and superiority to dance along the edge. And so she's just going to say, oh, Jeffrey Lacoste is lying. But I would think with a, with a good jury, with a fair jury, I don't think she is a credible witness, just as her brother wasn't a credible witness. If they get someone like the alternative juror who complained and said the jury had a group chat, so they all need to be investigated because perhaps maybe in that group chat, which would be about the dumbest thing a jury could do, they were talking about the case, which they were forbidden of doing. The judge denied that motion to investigate the jury in their group chat. But the alternate juror who contacted the defense and started that mo started the process of that motion being written he apparently was shaking his head at Georgia Kappelman and nodding along with the defense. He was very pro-defense. Other people suggested that maybe 
he was paid by the Adelson family to get on the jury somehow and 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 nullify it. I, I think that would be difficult to do. But if you listen to my last episode, Charlie Adelson, there was a tip that they got when they were investigating Dan Markell's crime that Charlie Adelson had done terribly in dental school. They he, they didn't even want to accept him. And then he did terribly. And somehow Harvey got a judge to get him his degree. I'll, I'll, I will try to find that the exact language of that trip tip and I'll um, read it. And when did you break up with Mr. Lacoste or when did the two of you break up? Um, it would have been end of June 2014. So not four days before the murder? No. All right. So June, end of June 2014 would have been the last time you saw him. No, no, no. I saw him after that. We were talking and kind of figuring out what we wanted to do, but we had we had gone on a trip to Gainesville the last weekend in June, mm -hmm. at which point we had a big argument and I really didn't want to be with him after that. So at that point for me, I was pretty much done, but there were more discussions until it, you know, formally ended. And when was the formal end? I remember seeing him that Monday night and telling him I wanted to have some space. Okay. So four days before the murder. So four days before Danny was killed. All right. And that was, was that the end end of your relationship with him? The last, when I told him I wanted some space. Yeah. Okay. Where did you go after <coughs> the TV repair man left? After he left, I stayed at the house for a while and I was working on some pieces of writing I was talking with various friends. I had a friend in town interviewing for a job at FSU. I was making plans to go meet her. The time got too close before her interview. And then I had two friends that I would often meet on Fridays, just kind of last minute. And so we made plans to go have lunch. All right. So what time did you leave the house to go have lunch? Um, I really didn't remember offhand, but I refreshed my memory and saw it was sometime around 1245. Okay. So it makes sense that you might've left the, your residence at about 1230. Sure. Okay. And did you go to the crime scene or very near the crime scene on no. your way from your residence to, I guess, to lunch or to wherever you were going next? No, I did not. So you never turned on Trescott drive that day. I went to turn on Trescott drive, but I saw that it had been blocked off by some tape. And so mm -hmm. I just kept driving on Centerville. Okay. And when you, you had to turn around at the tape, right, to go back out. I think I tried to turn right and it couldn't turn. So I would have made like a, the kind of turn, like a K turn and kept going. Was there a roadblock there with? There was tape. Yeah. And an officer was there. Yeah. As a lawyer, I don't, I don't know what crime scene tape means. I would, it was just a coincidence that I just drove by the crime scene. It wasn't me making sure that the hit was done. This is ludicrous, her story. Oh, I just had a bad sense of direction, so I had to go to a liquor store way out of my way. I didn't see an officer, but I did see a car. A, a law enforcement marked mm -hmm. vehicle? Okay. Did you have any contact with the officer? No. Okay. Did you do anything after that to try to find out what was going on down that roadway? No, I just assumed it was weather, or maybe a tree fell. Had there been bad weather that day? No, but it was summertime and there's electrical storms and trees fall. So that would have been pretty normal for summertime. Where were your kids supposed to be at the time that you encountered that roadblock? They would have been at school. And that's at the creative preschool? That's right. Who took them to preschool that day? Danny. And who was supposed to pick them up from preschool that day? Me. All right. So did you know for sure that they had made it to preschool that day at the time you encountered the roadblock? I just assumed, I mean, if they hadn't made it to preschool, Danny would have let me know, but. Did you attempt to call Dan Markell when you encountered the roadblock? No, I didn't think anything of it. I didn't think it was related to the house. So the realtor knew it was somehow related, was worried and called you. But you who live there, you were the lawyer, you didn't know that it might be important. Just 
you know, I have my mother's terrible imagination for if I even, even if I worry about something that might have gone wrong, but she's just cool, calm and collected when she sees police tape around the street where she used to live, this, the home of her ex-husband and sometimes the home of her children. It's just not believable in any way, shape, or form. Had you talked to Dan Markell or your kids that morning? My kids know that that would have been normal. And Danny and I tried to get in touch with each other, but we left. We were trying to figure out where Ben was going to go to kindergarten at the time. And we left voicemails for each other, but didn't get to talk. Okay. Did he leave you a voicemail message that morning? He did. Okay. We talked, I asked you earlier about him being scheduled to leave town the day after he was killed. Do you know where he was planning to go? He was going to New York to see his girlfriend. The message that he left you that morning, do you remember what he told you in the message? Um, I mean, I think it was about our son's school. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I don't really remember. Okay. Included in that was, was, was it included in that message that he was heading to the gym and was going to be at the gym between 9.15 and 10.30 that morning? I really don't remember, but that sounds like it could be what he would leave. Okay. Would it refresh your recollection to review a transcript of that voicemail? Sure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So the point of this is to say, Wendy knows the answer. She's going to say she doesn't remember. And she's going to hope that Georgia Kappelman doesn't have the paperwork to prove it there to show her. So she'll always take the chance and say, oh, I don't recall, especially if the evidence is bad for her or bad for her family, someone in her family. <laughs> okay. So did he say in that voicemail that he left you what his plans were in regards to the gym that day? He did. What exactly did he say about the uh, gym? About the gym, he said, I'm going to be at the gym probably between 9.15 and 10.30, but I'm happy to chat or meet with you. Maybe we can go for a walk at school or something like that. Let me know. Okay. So that particular voicemail doesn't sound very emotionally abusive. Would you agree with that? No, by this point in time, we were parenting really well and we were doing just fine. Get along great. Objection, you're on. Objection. Right. So, she, so Wendy, of course, has an incentive. She wants to sell the idea that this wasn't a contentious divorce. Nothing in in the paperwork shows that no one around her agrees with that. And they, they, they were co-parenting with ease. Move the strike. I'll strike the comment, Your Honor. Did you talk to your brother on the day of your ex-husband's murder? I did. And about what time of day did you speak to him? It would have been right after the repair guys were there. Cause that's when I called him to tell him, ask him whether I should, get the TV repaired or buy a new TV. So okay. it would have been morning. How long did you talk to him? I don't remember. Does 18 minutes sound incorrect? I, that sounds reasonable. Okay. Did you talk to him about other things other than just the TV? I really don't remember what else I talked to him about, but probably maybe I would have asked him about his work or we would have caught up. Did you happen to mention Dan Markell's plans to go to New York the next day? I don't see why I would have. Did you have WhatsApp on your phone at that time? I don't know if in 2014 I had WhatsApp. 
now we use it for all the parent chats at school. So it's everybody what, seems to have it, but I don't know if everybody had it back in 2014. What is WhatsApp? Um, WhatsApp app is a kind of an app you would use for texting. Do you know if your brother Charlie had it at that time? I have no idea if he had it at that time. Did you ever communicate with Charlie through WhatsApp? Maybe. I mean, maybe, maybe we had c encrypted communication that we thought was safe from the police's eyes. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, maybe I was using that kind of encrypted device. So of course, she's not going to acknowledge the the meaning of that question. I don't know if I had it at that time or if I had it later, I probably would have. Just not sure. Yeah. I... Did you have any contact of any kind with Catherine Magvanawa on the day of Dan Markell's murder? No. Did you ever communicate with her through WhatsApp? No, I never communicated with her at all. All right. Let's talk about, well, you communicated with her on the I, I saw her in person, but I'm saying I never texted with her, called okay. her. I never communicated via a device other than in person. Okay. Um, what about when you were talking to your brother? Did she ever get on the phone and speak to you? I don't think so. Okay. Um, I want to talk about where you went when you left your residence on the day of the murder. You tried to turn on to Trescott and then you ended up where? I went... Um, I was supposed to go to a party that night, a stock the bar party. So I went to a liquor store to pick up what they had asked for as the present for their party. Um, so I went to the liquor store, I picked up the alcohol, I stopped, I think I got gas, and then I went to lunch to meet my friends. And the liquor store purchase appears to have occurred at 1249 based on the receipt. Do you have any reason to dispute that? No, timing? that sounds right. Okay. And then from there to the restaurant? Yes. And where was the restaurant located? Um, Mosaic. I actually don't remember. I just remember I would go north on uh, Thomasville Road. All right. And, so it was and is the restaurant where law enforcement came to speak with you and you ended up going with them to the police station, right? That's correct. Do you agree or disagree that there have been some financial benefits to you and your boys as a result of Dan's death? I disagree. When did you decide to change the names of your children from um, Markel to Adelson? So after Danny's murder, there was a lot of news. It just hit the media and there were news stories everywhere. And Nancy Grace on CNN put pictures of my boys with their faces unblurred, just pictures of them. So I went looking for that Nancy Grace and I found a Nancy Grace. And I don't know if this is the episode that Wendy is referring to, but in that episode, she had blurred the children's faces. It's very unusual for a big time news outlet like CNN not to blur the faces of children. So I'm not so sure I believe Wendy here, but it's she needs to make some kind of argument that she was afraid for her kids' safety because it's not something we expect. We expect even if they were in the middle of a contentious divorce, even if there were bad feelings between them, that her sentimental feelings and her love for her children and her acknowledgement that her children should, that the memory of their father should be preserved for the children, including in that keeping his name and letting his name carry on. Instead, she changed his name. The, the, she, excuse me. She changed her children's names immediately within a year. So that shows so much contempt and, in my opinion, deep hatred towards Dan Markell and disregard for her children and her children's feelings and her children as a separate entity from herself. Mm.
and I was terrified. And so when they started school, I started school with my last name, thinking that would keep them safe, that wasn't, they wouldn't be associated with the murder. Wasn't the Adelson name in the press? Just it was as not as in the press. Raquel? Not yet. Do you agree that you legally changed the kids' names on July 6th of 2015? That sounds right. So it was actually a year after the homicide. A year after. When was the last time you talked to your mom? Did you talk to her today, yesterday? Um, I talked to her yesterday. In her emails, and we referenced one of them while you've been here on the stand, she talks about you giving performances and playing roles. Did you discuss anything about what you would do here today in court with your mother? No. Yeah, Donna decided to just take it easy when the whole world was watching. When she knew the whole world was going to be watching my testimony, she decided to have a massive personality change and we didn't discuss it. Because if you listen to the wiretaps in this case and the phone calls, Donna is the one, and also read her emails, is micromanaging her daughter to a crazy extent. And I believe, I mean, what other parent assumes that their grown daughter, a mother of two children, can't drive alone on the highway, that they need to make the trip to drive with her? It's bizarre. Were you involved in any way in the plot to kill your ex-husband? Absolutely not. Did you know it was going to happen, but maybe not know the details? I knew nothing. Is that why you went to the crime scene on the day of the homicide? I did not go to the crime scene on the day of the homicide. Do you know who all was involved in the murder? Well, I learned today, <laughs> but at the time, no. So those were dagger eyes. So we got the dagger eyes from Wendy. And she knows she has to be emphatic on this point that she did not drive by the murder scene. She just accidentally ended up there, guys. I even had, I uh, was listening to someone on this case, which I can remember who it was, who was arguing that she didn't drive by the murder scene. She came as close as she could. The only reason she didn't drive by is because it was, you know, Mark, it was, um, walled off from her, roped off. Okay. Have you ever privately confronted your brother about his role or possible role in the murder? My attorney has advised me not to have conversations with anyone in my family about the case. <clears throat> but you had a close relationship with your brother at the time of the murder, right? I absolutely had a close relationship with my brother. And your, how soon after the murder did your lawyer advise you not to talk to your family about it? In 2016. Okay, so what about the two years in between? Did you talk to him about it then? I mean, I talked to him about the fact that a murder occurred, but I guess I don't understand the question. But you never talked to him about the suspicions you raised in the law enforcement interview that your brother might have done it. No, I did not. You suspected your brother could have been a part of this, right? I suspected lots of people could have been a part of it. But he was one of the people, right? While I was talking with law enforcement for six hours, terrified out of my mind, I offered them every possible idea I could come up with. Right. And I, I don't think she's lying there. I do think she was terrified out of her mind but not because her husband had been, ex-husband, excuse me, had been murdered. It was because she was worried that she would be a, that she would be the suspect. 
and that they would all be arrested. And I think she threw up for the same reason. I think she was a nervous wreck right after this crime and then the weeks after. This is a very excellent uh, examination by Georgia Kaplan, especially this part, if I'm remembering correctly. And one of the possible ideas was that your brother could have murdered your child's father. I didn't right? really believe that was possible. It was part of the plot for you to be able to have plausible deniability about this? Absolutely not. Is it better for both you and your brother if you don't know the details of this? I don't even understand the question that you're asking me. When did you first? Oh, okay. The A student doesn't understand that question. She just doesn't know really how to answer it. But a better question was, when did she realize that her brother could have taken part in this? Uh, when she's coming into court? When he got arrested? When did she start considering that? That's the question I would would ask. But Georgia Kappelman really doesn't care about her answers, and this is the way lawyers are taught to ask questions. The questions are just for the jury, for the jury to start thinking about these things. She doesn't care what the answers are. But I would argue that I think that her ridiculous, unbelievable, improbable answers are one of the things that solidified her brother's conviction. And, and his too, his answers to Ka Georgia Kappelman's questions. And I would have liked to seen them pushed on a little things like, I would love to see Charlie explain what the difference between talking carefully and talking in code was. I would love to hear his explanation for that. First become aware that you might be a suspect in this case. I mean, as the ex-wife, I assumed I was a suspect from the beginning. What was your first thought when you were asked if anyone might have murdered Dan Markell for your benefit? I thought, oh my God. Maybe if I hadn't divorced him, he would still be alive. Maybe maybe this is my fault because I complained to the wrong person. Maybe Danny gave a student a bad grade and they came after him. I just was trying to think of who possibly could have wanted to hurt him. But you didn't say any of that before. I mean, the first thing you said was Charlie, right? I don't think so. Page 25 of your interview. Line five through 15, do you have any reason to dispute? Page 25, not five hours into it, you say, Charlie, might have done it, right? Can I see, please? You may. So she's getting time here to think about her answer. She knows what she said. She knows when she said it. But this gives her time to think about her answer. And what's a good answer to this question? This is going to be tab one, page 25. What I say here is that he would never do it. Right under the highlighted part, I say, no, he would never. Well, and then the next question after that, so she's putting out, like she's, she's acting as her own defense attorney here. So she's not going to read the part where she's wondering if her brother, Charlie, did it. She's going to highlight the most exculpatory part for her brother. But I would just, I would love to, I would love to see her answer, a answer some, 
some of the more difficult questions of which there are no good answers, right? Some more of the difficult questions of which there are no good answers. They're almost like a couple, Wendy and Charlie. Page 25, oh, yeah. line 5 through 15. I mean, my brother, the one, his name is Charlie, the one I'm really close to. He makes a lot of jokes in that taste, and it was a joke he made. He bought the TV for me this morning that got broken, and then I was talking to him about whether it made sense to pay or fix it or whether I should get a new one. And it was always like, it was always his joke that like, he knew that Danny always treated me badly. And it was always his joke. He said, I looked into hiring a hitman and it was cheaper to get you this TV. So instead I got you this TV. And you do say you don't think he would do it, but can we agree you brought up his name on page 25 of the interview? I did. When asked, would you ever ask someone to do something like this? You say not in a million years. When asked, okay, do you think someone would do this for your benefit without asking you? You say no. And when Isom starts to ask you what good does it serve, you say, I mean my brother, the one, his name is Charlie. Isn't that how it went? This is the transcript, but I think there's also inaccuracies in the transcription. I would have hammered her on that. I mean, if I were a lawyer. <laughs> so now the so so now Jeffrey Lacasse is lying. The transcripts are wrong. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just the Adelsons are like all they have is a story. Nothing in the record supports anything that she's saying here. Her version of of events in the emails, in the wiretaps, same goes for Charlie. But now the transcription is wrong? Is it kind of like Charlie Adelson, who was whispering his the, the words about his extortion to his father, the one thing we couldn't hear that would have proved his innocence? Miraculously, that's what he said in, his tri in this trial. And now... It's those darn stenographers. It's those darn, it's uh, that, <laughs> that type this out, type my interview out. It's exactly what she said. It's on YouTube. Anybody can go look at it. It's exactly what she said. And even Georgia Kappelman, this is where the snarky comments are coming. She's frustrated. And I understand it's, not only morally outrageous to get on the stand after taking an oath and lie this much and make such hard to believe stories up and, and tell them and, and get outraged when you're pressed with the evidence, but also it's just so, it's so morally repulsive. Her husband has been murdered and instead of separating herself from her family and being outraged, she's protecting them. All right. Do you want the culpable parties held accountable for murdering the father of your children? Absolutely. I'm grateful they're already in jail. But not if it's your family. It's not my family. I mean, somebody hired them, right? Not necessarily. Somebody paid them. I learned something this morning. <laughs> Yeah, me too. You didn't want him held accountable if it was your family members. Didn't you tell law enforcement that? That's not what I told law enforcement. What did you tell law enforcement? I told them that the person who did this should be held responsible and that I had nothing to do with it. Page 122, lines 7 through 12. If somebody tried to kill my ex-husband, they should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. The investigator says, regardless of who it is, and your answer is, I mean, it would be different if I thought it were my brother. But I don't think it was my family. It's different I now, isn't it? No, it's not different. That's exactly it's different what today, I said right it? here. No, that's not no right. No further questions. Okay, and that's, and I think that was the most successful part of Georgia Kappelman's Cross. It's the part that I, when I think, or 
examination. I'm sorry, it was a direct examination, not a cross. Right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, she's right. That's how she got immunity. I just thought that I was so glad she ended on it. It's the part of the of the testimony I remember. It made a big impact when I was listening to it live. I thought it was brilliant. And it doesn't matter what Wendy says there. She's caught. Her She's caught with her own words. And the jury heard it. And Georgia Kappelman made sure to keep underlining it for the jury with her repetitive questions about it. Keep pressing Wendy. And I really love when Wendy sort of flares her nostrils, <laughs> not flares her nostrils, narrows her eyes. They get real wide. Not narrows. I guess they, she opens her eyes. It kind of grits her teeth. Or her face gets very stony. And she's like, I'm grateful they were put in put in prison. But not if it's your family, right? She's grateful that the people she doesn't care about, the little people, the poor people. But once the rich people, the privileged people, part of her family, the cult, then she doesn't know anything about it. She's not reading the indictment. She doesn't know who's involved. She's learning things as she comes into court to testify. She's not discussing it with her mother. I think we might see, I really feel like this was a practice run. And I wouldn't be surprised. I think Donna's going to come first if they do it one by one, and then Wendy. And I wouldn't be surprised if if Charlie flips, but I think it's not going to happen soon. I think he's going to try his luck with his appeals, just like Katie did, the middle woman. This is where I'm going to end it for tonight. Thank you so much for watching this with me. Please, if you enjoyed this stream, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you back here again very soon. Have a good night, everyone.